Freitag, welcome. Guy, thank you for having me. Well, back in the hot seat, no pun intended for a chief, right? Yes. Yeah, it's just par for the course. For people that don't know, I know you pretty well over the past seven years. You're uh, chief of uh, Central Arizona Fire and Medical, aka CAFMA. Correct. You have about 200 uh, professionals that you work with That's in your correct. organization. Yeah. Um, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Appreciate um, it. So I want to talk about censure. I called you, I heard about this, and this is why I was surprised. Right. And this is why you're here today, is to, to really hear from you what's going on. Sure. Um, number one, thanks for what you did, what your organization did, and the cooperating uh, first responding organizations on Legato. Um, a very large fire. Yes. And uh, I remember the first things my ownership group, the Fane Students Group said, uh, we recognize this, that type of response didn't happen overnight. No. It wasn't as if everyone just was doing their jobs. That was a coordinated effort um, with multiple agencies involved. You guys did a great job. So regardless of whatever else is going on, thanks again for what you guys did and all Absolutely. the men and women that were involved in that. Well, you know, and I think that that also points out the importance of networking. And, and first and foremost, what you said is it didn't happen overnight. And you're right. Um, I've sat on the statewide mutual aid committee for nine years here in Arizona, working with fire departments from around the state to coordinate efforts in large events like this. So uh, when I got on scene that night and counted apparatus, quickly realized what we needed to do and made the phone call for countywide. And then when we didn't get the initial response we were hoping for, we called for statewide aid, activated that, made notifications. But it was the time that I spent at the state working on those plans that that allowed me to quickly know, understand and know exactly what I needed to do to get get the ball moving, get apparatus rolling this direction. We, uh, us, and by we, I mean CAFMA and the city of Prescott, we had the building surrounded. We, we had it pretty much covered. We had a unit from Cottonwood, but we still needed to backfill the fire stations. And right. that was vitally important. The other part of that was having the relationship that we've had with uh, the Fane family and, and Fane Signature Group over the years. Because as I was responding in that night, um, I was calling Ron directly. I called Brad, I called Anessa, I called you. Um, oddly, at 1 45, 2 o'clock in the morning, none of you actually answered the phone, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but at, at least I Sorry. made the calls. And, and eventually I felt bad because I just had to leave a message and say, Hey, it's Scott, give me a call. Legato's on fire. And I'm sure that's not a message anyone wants to wake up to. Not on April. First. First, no. And it wasn't a joke. The message was right. at 2 a.m. Right. Um, but it was my concern for you all and the loss of that the Fane Signature Group was going to have with the loss of that structure. Right. Um, and we made it a point that day as we brought everybody into um, the training facility to talk about the next operational period. Typically, we don't include the public in those meetings, but I thought in this situation, it was really important for uh, the Fane Signature Group for the town of Prescott Valley, for others who wouldn't normally be in there to be there and see what are we talking about? What does it mean to plan for an operational period? Um, what do we have on scene? What are we doing? What do we think it looks like over the next uh, day, two days, week? Uh, yeah, and we, I think it, it I think it really helped. And then we continue to meet um, yep. throughout the next six, seven days while uh, ATF was on scene. And kept everybody informed. And, and I just, that's the network that we have. That's the Im importance of being connected as a community, right. um, both, both public and private. And that's a perfect segue because that's, this is what makes up communities. Yes. I want to bring you in and talk to you as a community member, as a peer, what's going on. You know, the International Association of Firefighters, IAFF as they call it. Right. Um, sent out a pretty strong press release. Now I'm in media, right? so it looked like a little bit more than a press release, but it definitely had, it had some oomph behind it. Yes, it did. Um, and this, what they would call censure. And it was, I guess the union represents about 350,000 firefighters. Um, and they censured you. And they were citing things like failure to update cancer prevention techniques, setting fire engines out, 
um, to scenes with fewer than four recommended, uh, per, uh, four personnel as recommended, et cetera, et cetera. Right away, knowing you, I, I, I kind of question failing to update cancer prevention. Right. Anybody that has a first responder in a family or a friend, you've already been educated by that firefighter about how prevalent cancer is in your industry. Absolutely. I believe it's, is it 50%? Is it higher than that, lower than that? The incident rate of cancer in firefighters? It's not 50%, but there for each type of cancer, there's an increased incident within firefighters. So we'd have to break out the, the chart that shows um, over the general population, firefighters are X percent more likely to come up with bladder cancer, lung cancer, esophageal cancer. Uh, and, and there's a lot of scientific data behind all that. Right. Um, as a matter of fact, I was on the Senate committee in 2017 before we had the cancer presumptive laws in the state. And I sat with Dr. Shukla, who runs Vincere Cancer Institute. She's doing all the screenings on uh, firefighters in the state right now for cancer. Uh, we have a grant that is covering that for all of our operations personnel. Um, and then it, the, the legislation was ultimately passed. And I I sat on the committee studying it, and then I spoke in committee in favor of passing presumptive laws. And then in 2019, there was a push to expand the presumptive laws. And again, I went back down, worked with the union, and worked with our legislative officials, like uh, former Senate President Karen Fan, mm -hmm. um, to expand presumptive cancer coverage once again. And then because of that, there were some workers' comp companies pulling out of the industry so on the fire district side, we were left kind of hanging. And so ultimately I had uh, at the time, assistant chief Dave Tharp, very well versed in insurance. And we got a group of people together and worked with Ashton Tiffany out of the Valley and created a fire district workers compensation pool. So what are they referring to when they're saying failure to update cancer prevention techniques, when you're obviously highly involved with that? Right. subject within your industry? Uh, so some of the, the things that they talked about, they specifically use Station 51 as the example. And there's an interesting dynamic with Station 51 that many, prob many people in the community don't realize. So we were staffing a station at Williamson Valley Road in Iron Springs, and Prescott was staffing a station at 6th Street. We own the 6th Street station, the station we were staffing at Iron Springs and Williams Valley Road was actually a Prescott City fire station and also their administrative building. So there wasn't anything that we could do to that building while it was owned by the city of Prescott, managed by city of Prescott facilities. And while um, the city of Prescott fire department administrative staff was still occupying a good portion of the building, including the basement. Unfortunately, that meant there was uh, exercise equipment in the engine bay, turnout gear in the engine bay, which over the years we've learned, hey, that should be in a turnout gear room, but it's not our building. Uh, so finally, working with Chief Dura in April of 24, we were able to make a swap. And so we traded properties plus cash. And we now own that station at Wilmington Valley Road in Iron Springs. Mm -hmm. They own the station on 6th Street. But we had an agreement back then that we would take ownership in April, but we wouldn't move anything until July to give the city of Prescott time to remove their tech services stuff, their file cabinets, their desks. Um, the, the Prescott area, while at Urban Interface Committee, used to work in the basement, so they needed time to get things moved. Uh, but once July 1 hit and after July 4th, between then and the end of August, about 90% of the cancer pre presumptive stuff that needed to be done at the station had been completed. However, that's not mentioned in any of the documents that were turned over. For example, the weight equipment's moved into the basement. Um, we do have a turnout gear room built using, we had to uh, commandeer a couple of the old Prescott Fire Admin offices, but the turnout gear room is there. Unfortunately, the vendor for the rack systems is six weeks behind. So we have another two to three weeks before those come in, but nothing prevents the crews at that station from going ahead and moving their gear out of the out of the engine bay and putting them in that room. We just don't have anything to hang it on right now. Okay. So I get it. Then you've got uh, them saying, sending fire engines to scenes with fewer than recommended for personnel. When I first heard that, I go back to 
any business right. in this region or, or maybe in the United States, but I know in this region, uh, a, lot, a lack of labor, whether you're at Chipotle, there's two and a half people there working in. And I, I don't mean to demean, you know, what you guys do, but labor is labor in a lot of different ways. And we're all of our organizations are struggling to find personnel. Is that it? Because when I first saw that, I'm like, why, I, I, why would they send out an, an inadequate crew if they didn't have to? Right. Right. So, so NFPA, NFPA 1710, 1710, sorry, is the, the standard in the fire service. But if you look around the country, if, if having three person minimum staffing on an engine is a reason to censure a fire chief, then you're going to have to censure just about every single fire chief in the I'd country. Imagine. Uh, down in the Valley in Phoenix, they have four person constant staffing every day. They're allowed to drop below that for eight hours, drop down to three person. But as soon as you leave the Phoenix Valley, there aren't any other agencies, maybe Tucson, but no other agencies in the state that are running four person constant staffing. And for us to get to that level, you're talking to 2.5 million additional dollars that we would need in revenue. Now that said, we've been working under a strategic plan to add more staffing to our agency. So since 2016, we've we've added 40 new positions and operations. Uh, we've gone from, we, we typically refer to firefighters as just firefighter. Anybody that is a responder is a firefighter, whether right. you're battalion chief, captain, engineer, but just looking at backseat firefighters, newer folks, in 2016, we had 40. Today, we have 73. So we're seeing the, the increase in personnel as we try to staff up the best we can, but that's a funding issue, which is we're limited under Prop 117 in the state. Um, and it's also getting applicants. But if you look at the three-year staffing plan, the plan shows uh, moving two of our stations to constant staffing of four. Uh, those stations are where the reserve ambulances live. So we're going to start our ambulance service October 1. Um, and so if there's a, an issue in the system with EMS, that four-person engine company can grab that ambulance and put that thing into service. Um, in addition, we went with firefighter paramedics and EMTs on the ambulances because that adds additional firefighters for response. So we, we've added people. At the same time, we could potentially run four-person staffing every single day as long as we didn't allow anybody else off on vacation as long as we didn't allow anybody to call in sick, um, as long as we didn't respond to wildland fires, as long as we didn't allow people off to go to training, um, name the, the, the topic and there's an impact on staffing. But three person is pretty standard staffing across the country. Okay. So, and the final one they, they mentioned here is creating a hostile work environment. I, I heard the word bullying um, rank and file members fearing retaliation. Where's that coming from? I don't know because I've never heard that before. There's one complaint about a hostile work environment that was uh, filed in July, I think, and it was against a battalion chief. And then myself and our operations chief were both named in it saying that we sent him to do our bidding, which um, that investigation is coming to a close. Not all of the information is out with that one. Um, but I can say that at the end of the day, myself and the chief Fetima, our ops chief, have both been exonerated of any charges. There was no hostile work environment created by us. Uh, we have never heard any complaints of that internally. Um, I, honestly, I don't know where that comes from other than to add something to the list uh, to raise the ire of the firefighters who were in Boston to vote for right. the censure. Where do you... Where do you think this is all coming from? Or is that something you can't comment on because it's being reviewed? Or I, I don't know the process. Right. I like going into these interviews not knowing a lot. Right. I just want to ask the questions is, where do you think this is all coming from, if you can answer that? So, so a couple of things. Back on the hostile work environment, just briefly. Normally, when an organization does an investigation internally um, or and has it reviewed by outside third parties, and there's discipline involved, we don't release the information publicly, right? It's available through records requests, but typically we don't release it. Because of what's happening today, the results of that investigation, when everything's concluded, will be released. 
uh, because there's a lot of comments out there about the agency and and me and to protect the agency, to protect myself as the chief and our staff, it's important that the other side of the story gets out. So that's yep. going to happen. Now, as to why, there's, there's a couple of reasons. I can't go into a lot of detail that we could look at this and go, hmm, maybe there's something there. Um, so there's a behavioral health, mental and behavioral health group attached to the, the state union out of Phoenix. Um, we were notified of some, some activities or actions of that group that we did not approve of. Uh, we filed some complaints. We provided it to our attorney. He filed some complaints at the state level, and we'd have to talk to him to get further on those things. Um, but of course, that didn't sit too well with some union folks. Uh, the other side of this is the there's also a healthcare trust associated with the union and members of the union. Uh, there was a request for us to get a quote from them this year. And because of things that were happening at the time within our agency, I said, not this year. Let's take a look at it next year. Let's just get through this. There was just, at the end of last year, there was a lot happening and there was just no way for us. We didn't have the capacity to review it. And then as we we got into the first of 2024, that trust uses Blue Cross Blue Shield. We all know what was going on between Dignity and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Right. Uh, can you imagine our personnel had we started reviewing uh, a moving them from our current insurance, which does have medical coverage up here, to one that at the time didn't. It's not going to go well. Um, we were notified on May 15th that an agent who is an agent for the trust uh, had breached our insurance pool system and taken our data, census data and uh, claims data. And so our pool has hired uh, a law firm out of New York, and they have filed uh, complaints with the Office of Civil Rights for HIPAA 2 violations, which are pretty significant. If, yeah. you, if you look at it, right, they're pretty significant. And so there's a lot of underlying dots to connect with all of that. And part of that is being connected by uh, an outside third party attorney who's investigating that the board hired. Uh, but if you start really delving into the details of that, there's there's a lot of questions there. Um, and so when I look at why, there's there's two things right there that I had said no to. And then you have uh, a data breach that's pretty significant with federal um, complaints being filed. Right. And so people may get upset about that, but. Everything's a story, right? And there's always multiple yeah. stories within the story. Oh, there absolutely is. And. The challenge right now for us is to just continue. Our our folks in the field are still doing great work out there. Yep, responding to nine one one calls, smiling at people, uh, helping them in their time of need. Um, we do have an, enough personnel to respond. Could we use more? Absolutely. You know that's why we bought the property at Glassford Hill Road and Santa Fe Loop, uh, because if you look at a map and you look where the stations are, there's a pretty good gap there. Mm -hmm. We can't build that station until the community decides how they want to fund it because it's not something we can take out of general revenue. Um, and in the meantime, we're hiring people to put up an 11th 24 hour unit um, along with our 40 hour unit. So uh, we're adding personnel, we're adding equipment, we're adding resources, uh, but you, the, the money doesn't grow on trees. Nope. And the community has to decide how much they're willing to pay and how much service they want for that. There's a lot of difficulty with all this during this time, whether it's taxes or housing right. costs or. Sure. Um, people are moving here. Oh, yeah. Um, our constant conversation is, is growth in housing. Uh, we think the conversation is focused in the wrong area. People are talking about stopping growth. Well, we're going to stop growth. Maybe we should talk about how we use water as individuals. Right. Right. And then what are those solutions? Because it's not going to stop. You can't stop it. The best you can do is manage it. Right. And managing it means approving good quality pro projects. Right. Um, well, I really appreciate you sure. taking the time. Um, I want to shift gears with you, though, if you, if you don't mind. Can I, yeah, can I cover one more thing real quick? Absolutely. Because one of the other narratives out there right now is that we have priorita prioritized hiring support staff or administrative staff That's over right. firefighters. Yep. And 
If you look back at 2016, we had 33 support staff and the ratio between support staff and responders was 76 point something percent to 24 point something percent, right? In 2024, by the end of the year, we're going to have right around 50 support staff and the ratio remains pretty close to the same, 75, 25. And you get even closer to what the ratio was previously if you subtract the five positions that we've hired that are actually paid for by outside third-party contracts. So yeah, that comment, I heard that, it sounded short-sighted, like there's phases in an organization yes. where you might be hiring more over here right. and then you grow and you respond over here. So when you're focusing on just one aspect right. of the organization and criticizing it, it's not really looking at the whole whole picture. Well, if you look at the ratio, the ratio has been the same of support that staff across to the staff. industry pretty much? Or? Uh, it's a pretty solid number okay. with that, especially with the complexity that we have as an organization because uh, we are self, mostly self-sufficient with fleet services, tech services, warehouse, you know, all the things that if we were in the Valley, maybe we could get those from outside, outside sources, but up here we can't, they're not available. So people forget how we really are isolated. Right. It sounds like we're, we're like Phoenix. We're not. I mean, no. Anybody who's traveled up here, you're up here. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you're here for an hour and a half. Right. Even with the Legato fire, when we called for the mutual aid, it took an hour and a half for them to get here. Um, and we have a unique set of economic challenges, housing challenges. Absolutely. Industrial, commercial challenges. Um, that That's why when I was reading this stuff, I'm like, ah, something's... Just want to know more. Yeah. yeah it, it, you can say something's off here. Something's off. Something's off. Okay. Um, it, it's definitely something off. And hopefully we'll be able to work through it. But in the meantime, uh, I just want the community to rest assured that our folks are responding. They're still doing good works. Internal strife is internal strife. Um, unfortunately, uh, I never had the opportunity to sit down with anybody and discuss any of this on the union side. Um, so I didn't know that this was coming. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You want to shift gears? Yeah, let's okay, shift. Cool. Let's shift. Um, well, share with something that's going on that's good news. Because you know we're all about that. Right. So what's, what's the latest good development that we can share with the community? It, just anything. It doesn't matter. So there's a couple of things. There is um, there's a new National Emergency Incident Reporting System coming online. It's going to replace an old antiquated one. It's really going to help a lot in the American Fire Service with uh, getting the data and statistical data that we need to make good quality decisions. Uh, CAFMA has been chosen one of the first 50 in the country. We are a beta site for the new system, which is, which is pretty cool. The other thing we're working on is we're doing the first ever joint accreditation with the city of Prescott. It's never been done before. It's a joint standard of cover between Prescott Fire Department and CAFMA. And the reality is one can't respond without the other. Right. Uh, we're interdependent. So that is, I mean, that's pretty amazing to see that happen. And then just Monday, we started the first ever joint recruit academy with Prescott and CAFMA. So yesterday morning or Monday morning, uh, Chief Dura and I were able to go in and welcome the new recruits. And it was it was so cool to see um, all these red shirts out there. Some said Kaufman, some said Prescott, but they were all integrated together. We have Prescott trainers out there. Why, Kaufman was, trainers. why was that done? Because I, I, it must be a competitive environment as a whole. Right. Not talking Prescott and Kaufman, just in general, I know that you guys could probably get poached at any time from a Phoenix department sure. that maybe has a bigger budget. Hey, come down here. We got a nice condo for you. And right. Cause they got housing. It, is that part of it is a, a cooperative agreement in terms of recruitment is just beneficial for the community as a whole. So the recruitment process is separate. It's once we conclude our recruitment process that we bring all the recruits that are already hired together. Okay. And, now we run, run one regional academy. Okay. So they're being trained together 15 weeks. This is the first academy that Prescott has ever done a green academy. This is our third. And by green academy, we mean you didn't have to have firefighter one and two to get hired. You're going to get firefighter one and two th through the academy. Okay. And we did that to open up opportunities for people and increase recruitment for us uh, by making it easier to apply. 
Okay. Well, that's great news. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's really good news. And we're excited about that. And again, October 1st, uh, our ambulance service that that you followed, yep. you know, nine years in the making. And o- bit. October 1, it goes live. We're super excited. We're going to invite the community out. Uh, we, we plan on doing hose uncouplings. Uh, we're going to divide staff up because both ambulances will go in service at exactly the same time on October 1. Um, so we're going to divide staff up, invite community members in both Chino Valley, Prescott Valley, wherever they want to come from, uh, to come out and be with us as we we uncouple the hose and start uh, ambulance transport service. Did that, does this development, because it's just launching, does that create more jobs, more net jobs in the in the region? It does, yeah, because we had to hire for our ambulance transport right. service. And and here's the thing that a lot of people don't look at. We're using firefighter paramedics and firefighter EMTs as opposed to civilian paramedics and EMTs. What that does for us is it adds more responders, firefighters to our ranks um, so that if an engine and that ambulance are the first ones onto a structure fire, if there's not an immediate transport need, gotcha. those firefighters become firefighters. Double now, down. now you've got five to six firefighters on scene in a short period of time. Got it. And when they're not running a structure fire, because under state statute, we have to bill for services. So when they're not fighting a structure fire, they're actually running calls and generating revenue that cover the expense for, for having the firefighters there. Right. So they're covering their own salaries. Gotcha. So just like any other company, we're pursuing technology and, and you know, AI is everywhere. It's, it's, it's almost overwhelming. And I actually asked somebody to start researching every department and finding out what do they do? What are their mundane tasks and can we use technology to make their, their jobs more efficient? And I had this person go from department to department, right. really helpful. So I just didn't have time and we needed somebody because we knew there are places that we could improve efficiency. Sure. Is this something that Capman and the fire departments are doing uh, currently? Because it's it's so prevalent sure. and there are some immediate benefits if they're applicable to the job function. And I think we're, we're constantly looking at how can we be more efficient using whether it's AI or other technology. I know our, our tech division's completely revamping how we've done uniform orders over the years to streamline it using technology to our advantage. Um, it, we, we have a drone program where we're using drones to help with search and rescue efforts. That's pretty cool. Um, we, we use the drones on the Legato fire. So yep. we're, we're using that technology, um, internally, we're using more AI to review documents and, and put, uh, things together. I, I, I don't know a better word for it than documents, producing right? Documents, producing yeah. documents. Right. We can use those to help produce documents. Um, but we're always looking at technology as a way to do we need to add another person or is it that the software we're using is inefficient and therefore by upgrading this, we would, we would be able to improve our overall efficiency and not need that additional person. So I get ads for AI marketing or copywriting or Mm -hmm. video editing. Do you get emails for, uh, firefighting apps and stuff that AI is coming out with in your industry specific? We, we do. I pretty much ignore all that because I'm not allowed to buy anything. Right. Uh, that's our Too warehouse bad. and fleet and assistant chiefs, job. but I know. I, uh, but it, so we get some of that stuff, but we try to, to send it to the appropriate uh, aid department or division. Um, I will tell you that right before I came over here to record this today, I was online with a vendor and we're always talking about community safety. And so um, I was trying to run interference because I know our assistant chiefs are just overwhelmed, especially with vendor requests. Sure. So I'm like, all right, I'll talk to you. And then if it's quality, I'll send it. And it's actually pretty cool. So, you know, we put the track, the uh, traffic preemptive devices in uh, all the stoplights and Right. So you guys push a button, you get right through. But the GPS just automatically does it. Just automatically does it. So there's another company, it's called Haas, H-A-A-S. And what it does is they, it puts a device on your apparatus and then uh, the newer vehicles all have Apple CarPlay or Waze or whatever. Right. So if we are responding down 69 or up 69, this device will send a message to any vehicle that is uh, on Apple CarPlay or using right. Waze, 
and it says emergency vehicle approaching or you're approaching an emergency incident, please move to the left. Because, you know, you get the road signs that say traffic crash ahead and you're like, well, which lane do I need to be in? Right. This would tell you. There's also a piece of it That's that, sweet. that um, notifies responders if, if two units are coming to a blind intersection responding, um, this will give them a signal that, hey, you've got another emergency vehicle approaching this intersection. You know, be careful of that. It's just a heads up. So everything, there's a price to everything, right? But yep. uh, I want our folks to review it and see if it would work for us. I know Chrysler already has it built into their vehicles. I think that it's got to be automatic coming soon for the general public in terms of, because we already have it on our phones, right? That crash right. sensor. Right. If I were to fall off a cliff right now, I'd probably notify first responders. Um, I got to imagine that eventually they're going to figure out a way that would be in all cars. Right. They already know what we're doing. Well, they could they could put it in every other vehicle. It's just Chrysler's the only one that signed off on it so far. Right. So if you have a 2018 newer with a, a smart info system in a, a Chrysler vehicle, then that vehicle will typically tell you, notify you when an emergency vehicle is approaching. And I, I spoke with someone a couple of weeks ago that has it in her car, and she's like, it is the most amazing thing. Really? So when I looked at the website before I got online with this person, I was like, oh, wow, this is this is what she was telling me about. Will it work in our community? Will it will it provide uh, additional level of safety for our responders and the community? Yet to be seen. But it's certainly something we should look at. Where my mind just went was my flight training and cockpit resource management, CRM. Right. And I worry now, I, I love all this stuff. I love technology, but there's a section of the population that doesn't do real good with a lot of distractions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're already texting on the phone and driving and going through intersections and lane changing. And now they've got people texting them and the radio, and now we're going to get these alerts and I'm wondering at what point does too much information for the average non-trained driver, if you will, get affected negatively by it? But more importantly, are they going to have to change the way they train drivers? And are they doing that right. differently now? I don't know. I'm I don't too know old either. to remember my driver's training. But you got to figure that there's going to be a lot of notifications coming through these devices as we drive or... Because right. when you're flying, you're getting, you know, ATC and you're getting weather and then you're looking out for traffic. And so I just, I'm just curious as whether or not that's going to become overload at some point, even though the technology, I, I right. see it being really beneficial. Well, I think there's a lot of overload right now because one of the things you forgot to mention is the breakfast burrito in one hand, the coffee <laughs> in the other <laughs> while trying to shave with their toes. Into your lap. And, you know, it, right. you're not really driving. The car is just kind of going wherever. Well, that's why you need those little stuffy things that go between the right. seats and the console. Yeah. My wife got those. So now the fry stays right on top. Right. You get it two days later. So you can get it perfect. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of distracted driving out there. Yeah. And, you know, back when we started driving, not calling us old, but back when we started driving, uh, the distraction was a stereo, you yeah. know, cassette deck. And you actually CD. had to, you actually had to dial it just right for 101.2 right yeah gotta try to get this thing in there right but there were far less distractions when we started driving than there are today right um because now we're holding that the, our cell phones are computers in our hands and not only are we connected but we have this need to know immediately instant gratification so yep. somebody texts and it's like can't wait i gotta text back i gotta know what this says i can't I can't wait to read this, call this, do whatever with it, right? And it's just, have, have, people aren't paying attention. Have, has distracted driving surpassed DUI? You know, that I don't know. That would be a question for Chief Tyser uh, with PD, but I could see where that's a possibility, uh, a re very real possibility. Yeah, I, I would put my money on that it does. Right. I'm guessing, but from what I just see on the road, I, right? it's just kind of nuts. Oh, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, it's crazy. But uh, hopefully we can implement some of these other things. But overall, I think we've got a lot of good things going within our organization. Um, we're, we're in a we're in some rough waters right now, um, and we just need to be able to find our way through it. Gotcha, Chief Scott Freitag, Kappa. Thanks for coming yep. in, dude. Thanks, really guy. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you yep. for your time.